So I pass it off to Arlene to begin the tour. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, hello to everyone and thank you for joining me on my tour. I'm uh, delighted to be here and um, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself before I start. Um, I grew up in China and our house was literally right between our first Chinatown that I'll be starting the tour um, at and then the second Chinatown, which we now call West Chinatown or Chinatown West. So really put me in an ideal spot. And with my parents being very active in the Chinese community, um, especially my mother, Jean Lum, I will be incorporating some of my family stories as we walk along um, through our first, first Chinatown and then later on West Chinatown. Um, but before I start, the tour, I just want to give you some historical context. So I'm just going to start up my, my uh, screen and share that so, you, so we can see that. And uh, I want to um, give you some historical context because, um, let me just here we are, there we go. So you can, um, everybody can see everything. And I'm just going to fix this so you just see the screen. There we go. That's what I want to show you. So, um, of course, everything starts in China. This is a map of China. And most of the names that you see on here are the um, names of the provinces in China. But the one that I really want to point out to you is the province of Guangdong, um, because most of the early Chinese that came to Canada were from this province. And whenever we talk about why is it that people wanted to leave their country and go to a new country? So we talk about what were the push and pull factors. So if we look at that province of Guangdong, right at the south end of China there, and we look at what some of those push factors were, um, first of all, lots of natural disasters from the 1850s to the early 1900s, 14 floods, seven typhoons, four earthquakes, two droughts, five famines, and add on top of that, only enough food to feed one third of the population that was living in that province. And then layered on top of that, lots of banditry, civil wars, and a corrupt government that was really imposing high taxes on the people living in that area there. So when, um, and also to point out that the capital of uh, Guangdong province was called Canton at the time. And that's why you get you, you hear the phrases Cantonese language, Cantonese food, Cantonese customs. Um, so when news started uh, arriving in all the little villages um, in that province about a faraway place, that if you went there, you would become rich. And so that's where we had our first gold rush in 1858 which was in British Columbia at the time, still a colony of Canada. So this is a rare picture of a Chinese man panning for gold. So that was the first um, major wave of Chinese coming into, um, into British Columbia. The second wave arrived for the construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Now, this transcontinental railway was promised by Prime Minister John A. Macdonald to British Columbia colony that if British Columbia joined Canada in 1871, um, as opposed to joining the United States, because the United States was very uh, anxious to have British Columbia join the United States. But British Columbia said, we'll join Canada if you promise a railway that will connect us, which way out in the West, to the rest of Canada. So that was made as a promise. But the problem was there weren't enough workers at the time to build this railway, the western portion of the Canadian Pacific Railway. So the second major influx of Chinese coming into Canada was for the construction of the CPR. And that went on from 1881 um, until 1885. And when that was completed in 1885, this historic photograph really if you think of a picture, what is a picture that really represents Canada as a country from coast to coast, from sea to sea? It would be this picture of the driving of the last spike. So Sir John Donald Smith 
uh, Sir, Sir Donald Smith, pardon me, is there uh, driving in that symbolic glass spike into the railway. And if you'll notice all the faces around him, not one Chinese face there, even though the Chinese made up 80% of that workforce. And what happened at the completion of the railway was the government really didn't want any more Chinese coming to Canada because there was a lot of objection to so many and there were over 15,000 Chinese that came to help build that CPR. So the government in 1885, the year that the railway was completed, imposed the Chinese Immigration Act of 1885, and a $50 head tax for any Chinese coming into Canada was charged. And so um, this was supposed to be a way to deter more Chinese from coming. And worse still, the government did not want the Chinese who were already here, and they were mostly men, to start bringing over their wives and children. They did not want the Chinese to start family life. Um, so $50 in 1885. But when you think of those push factors to get out of China, they were so strong that the Chinese kept coming into Canada. So the government doubled that head tax from $50 to $100 in 1900, but still the Chinese kept coming because of that push factor. So in 1903, the government said $500. That's how much the head tax is going to be. And so $500 at that time was a lot of money. You could have purchased two houses in Vancouver. So this um, picture that I have here is what a head tax certificate looked like. So when somebody um, arrived on the shores of British Columbia, they would be um, issued this uh, certificate to show they had paid the head tax. So this was issued to a man named Chin Ng, and it has on the certificate his, his headshot, says when he arrived here, where he arrived from, and that he had paid the 500 dollar head tax, which was a really important, this document was very important for the Chinese not to lose, because if they ever traveled back to China to visit their families, and they came, tried to come back into Canada without that certificate, they would have had to pay that head tax again. So um, that head tax was in place from 1885 until 1923. And what happened in 1923? Because the Chinese still were coming into Canada, the Chinese imposed an exclusionary law, and it was called the Chinese Immigration Act of 1923. And so from 1923 until 1947, 24 years, there was an exclusion law, and this only applied to Chinese coming, uh, Chinese immigrants. So Chinese were no longer allowed to come into Canada. There were a few exceptions that were allowed in, like diplomats, um, and students, but other than that, Chinese were not allowed to come into Canada. Not only that, any Chinese who were already in Canada, didn't matter if you were born in Canada or if you were a naturalized uh, citizen, and um, then you would have to apply for this identification certificate. And I have to thank the government for this identification card because this is the card that was issued to my mother. Um, her name was Wong Toi Jin. Wong is her surname and Toi Jin was her name. And my mom was only four years old at the time. Um, even though my mother was born in Nanaimo, British Columbia, so she was a Canadian born Chinese, she was still required. My grandparents had to get this identification card for her. And what you'll notice on this um, identification card is it's dated in Vancouver on the 14th day of May in 1924. Now, the exclusionary law in 1923 was enacted on July the 1st. And while all of Canada was celebrating Dominion Day on July 1st, the Chinese called that day Humiliation Day. And it was for many, many years that the Chinese refused to celebrate Dominion Day because of this exclusionary law. And so you can see, and the Chinese were, the ones that were already in Canada had one year to apply for this identification card. So my grandparents really called, made a close call because um, this identification card was issued May 14th, 1924. So there was only about another month or so left before the deadline was reached for um, my grandparents to get identification cards and um, the penalty would have been fine or prison if you did not um, get your identification card in time. So anyhow, here's a picture of my mother when she was four years old. So given that historical context, we're now gonna start our tour. And uh, we're gonna start 
on the corner of Bay and Queen Street at Old City Hall, proceed up Bay Street to Dundas Street, go west on Dundas Street, then go south on Elizabeth Street, um, and then along Hagerman Street, up Chestnut Street, and then go all the way along uh, Dundas Street till we get to Spadina, and then we're going to end up just south of Spadina at Chinatown Center. So that is where we're going to be traveling again from our first Chinatown into West Chinatown. So here we are at the corner of Bay and Queen, and why is it that I start the tour at Old City Hall? Um, three reasons. The first is that the very first Chinese recorded in the city of Toronto directory is a man named Sam Ching, and he had a Chinese laundry at 9 Adelaide Street East, not very far from this site here. And if you walk in that area, the building where the laundry was, of course, is gone because it's all high rise there. But there is a laneway that's called Ching Lane. And if you ever chance upon that, Ching Lane is named after Sam Ching, the first Chinese recorded in Toronto. The second reason I chose this is because this corner would be at the southeast corner of the ward or St. John's Ward. And the ward is where um, various um, immigrant groups settled when they moved into the city of Toronto. So of course, after our Indigenous peoples, we had uh, people coming in from England and Ireland and Scotland. Um, we had uh, Blacks that were coming and settling in this area, um, fleeing from slavery in the south, and then also from other parts coming into uh, Toronto from other parts of uh, Canada. And then also followed uh, was the uh, Jewish immigrants who were coming in from East Europe, fleeing the pogroms there. And by the time the Chinese started settling in this area, which would have been in the early 1900s, going up um, into the 1920s, this area of the ward was really getting quite run down, um, but it was regarded as a settlement, um, one of the early settlement areas for all the newcomers that were moving into the city. So if we were actually standing um, at city, Old City Hall and we're standing at the steps, which you see at the bottom of there, and you climb up those beautiful steps of the main entrance of City Hall. And at the top of the steps, you'll see the pillars that are there. And at the top of those pillars, there are these what we call grotesques. And the grotesques, I want to really point out this one grotesque, which is the face of a Chinese man. Now, the architect of Old City Hall, and that um, Old City Hall was completed in 1899. And at the time, it was the largest municipal project being built in North America. So it was a substantial project. But uh, uh, Mr. Lennox was the architect, Edward Lennox. And um, it's kind of interesting to know that as he was near completion in 1899, he approached city councillors and said, I would like to um, acknowledge that, have somewhere on the building that I'm the architect for this building. But his request was turned down by City Hall because um, the project was running behind schedule and it was running over budget. So his request was turned down. So what Mr. Lennox did was one of the ways that he did to acknowledge his contribution was he um, one of the um, grotesques is his face and um, the council just had no idea that this was being done and if you look at some of the other um, figures the grotesques there they're you know kind of contorted faces it's rumored that those are the faces of the city councillors. So that was Mr. Lennox's way of getting back at city council. But Lennox also um, carved his name under the eaves troughs all around Old City Hall as well, another way for him to get some recognition for um, this magnificent building that was built. So anyhow, the Chinese uh, started moving into the ward um, early 1900s, and by 19, early 1920s, we had quite an established area that came to be called Chinatown. And by the early 1920s, it was the largest, the third largest Chinatown after Victoria and Vancouver. So now walking north on Bay Street. Um, so this is looking south from Bay and Dundas. And we're going to walk along Dundas Street. And the building we are going to be visiting next is uh, the Lem Sai Hong Family Association building. And this is a three-story building. So if you are to notice um, just on the south side of Dundas Street between 
Bay and Elizabeth Street, it's the only low rise building. It's the only three story building because it's now dwarfed by all these high rise buildings because the Lem Family Association did not want to sell their building. What used to be to the left of the Lem uh, Family Association was the Wong Family Association. Um, and like most of the other family associations, they moved uh, to West Chinatown. Um, and the only other family association that's left in our first Chinatown is the Lee Association, also further along uh, on Dundas Street. So this family association, and I have to tell you that family associations up until the Second World War were really the foundation of our early Chinese community. In the absence of what we have now, welcome houses, settlement services, there was nothing like that in place for the Chinese moving into the city. So what these associations provided was um, if you needed a place to live, you wanted to find a job, you needed to borrow money because Chinese could not borrow money from banks. Um, if you had a letter that you want sent home, um, you went to your association. And how the, the membership was formed is that people with the same surname would go to their surname association. So this association was for anybody with the surname Lum, and that's Lim, Lam, Lin, um, depending what Chinese language or dialect you spoke, um, that is uh, the association you went to. This building, this is what it used to look like before it was renovated. And you see it's a three-story building. And the Chinese characters on the very top floor is Lam Sai Ha Tong. And the Chinese character for Lum is on the right side. So you read it from right to left. And the third floor is where the Lem family had their um, headquarters and meeting hall. And the second floor was a very famous restaurant called Sai Wu Restaurant, which I will talk a bit more about later on. And uh, it, it was uh, later moved, the uh, Sai Wu Restaurant moved across the street to a newer building. And then on the street level were retail stores. So this is um, one of the few buildings uh, that are left standing from our first Chinatown. Walking along uh, west along Dundas Street, we're going to get to the corner of Elizabeth and Dundas Street. And on the northeast corner is this three-story building known as the Weinberg Apartments. Now, this building, again, um, was built. What happened was um, as homes and buildings were being torn down in the ward and being replaced, the idea behind this three-story was that the second and third floors would be um, affordable housing apartments and the rents would be subsidized by the businesses on the street level. So it was a very innovative idea at the time. And what I really want to point out is what would have been a, a storefront on Elizabeth Street. And that would have been the office of Doc Yip. Now, Doc Yip was a very, very interesting man. He was born in Vancouver into a family of 23 children. His father, Yip Sang, was a very wealthy um, merchant, very successful merchant, very um, high ranking in the Chinese community in Vancouver. Um, and you and <laughs> um, Doc Yip came from, as I mentioned, a family of 23 children. But because his father was so wealthy, Doc Yip was able to study at Columbia University, University of Michigan, University of British Columbia, and then he applied, moved to Toronto because he wanted to go into law school, but he was turned down three times by Osgoode Hall, but eventually got accepted into Osgoode Hall. And when um, Doc Yip graduated, he opened his office on Elizabeth Street. So he is the very first Chinese Canadian lawyer in Canada, and his office was in this um, building here on Elizabeth Street. Um, now, Doc Yip was the kind of man he didn't, ne he never wanted to retire. And um, later in his later years, he became a school trustee uh, for the Toronto um, Board of Education. And um, when he was 80 years old, he went into acting. So you, you might have seen him in some television series or even in some feature films because um, he was he went into acting as well. So he was he had a very, very interesting life. The other place I want to point out is right along Dundas Street, also part of that Weinberg apartment. And that pink sign was the site of uh, Tom Locke Pharmacy. Now, Tom Locke uh, was born in Toronto, and he was one of the um, in the he was born into one of the 12 or 13 families that were in Chinatown at the time. Um, 
there were very, very few women in Chinatown. Again, because of this head tax, because of the exclusionary law, there were very, very few women. And in Toronto, the ratio of men to women was around 17, 18 to 1. So um, it kind of interesting, um, uh, and I'll show you a picture later on of uh, his parents. But Tom Locke, um, he uh, served in World War II, and when he was there, he volunteered for a top secret um, uh, operative called Operation Oblivion that was to um, spy behind enemy lines in Southeast Asia during the, uh, the war against Japan. Uh, what well, part of his training was in Australia, and at the time he met his wife, Joan Lim, an Australian uh, woman there, and uh, they got married. And when the war ended, uh, Tom Locke returned to Canada, returned to Toronto, and he couldn't bring over his wife because of the Exclusion Act. And Tom Locke couldn't go to Australia because of their white Australian policy. So here they were after the war, a stateless couple. But fortunately, Tom Locke was able to get permission to bring over his wife. And so that the happy ending is Tom Locke went into the School of Pharmacy again because he had served uh, during the war um, and graduated. And he opened the first Chinese owned uh, pharmacy in Chinatown. And he was one of the that he was the first uh, Chinese pharmacist east of the Rockies. Um, so um, very uh, important person in our, our history. So if we're still standing on the corner of Elizabeth and Dundas, now looking south on Dundas, um, totally different from how it looked before the war. And the only building left standing is that building on the right-hand side, that two-story building. And uh, if you look all the way down the end of Elizabeth Street, you can see um, one of the towers of uh, New City Hall. But this is what it looked like in the third, this picture was taken in the 30s, um, looking down Elizabeth Street. And at that time, Elizabeth Street went all the way down to Queen Street. And on the right-hand side, is that two-story building um, that is now the only building left standing from those early years. And in the upper left-hand corner in the background there, you can see the clock tower of Old City Hall. And uh, what I like about this picture is you can see the Dundas streetcar tracks running east-west um, east there. And then uh, looking down the street on Elizabeth Street, you can see a horse and buggy, and then you can see the cars. So, you know, it just captures that moment in uh, history. Here are some of the stores that you would have seen if you um, were in Chinatown. Um, so these one and two story uh, buildings that were, as I mentioned, by the time the Chinese moved in as the last major immigrant group to move into the area, the, uh, the buildings were getting quite run down. It was very condensed. And what had been built for like single families were now crowded with uh, many, many people crowded in. And um, as the Chinese were uh, moving in and the Jewish community was moving out, um, the Jewish community was moving to Spadina, to the uh, to Kensington Market, and then the Chinese were moving into the, the businesses there. Another picture that I really like a lot, again in the 30s, this is on uh, Elizabeth Street and there's the Dundas streetcar um, that used to loop around on, uh, come south on Elizabeth and loop around. And um, even in the 30s, there were traffic jams. So <laughs> there's a policeman directing uh, the traffic jam. So I just like to include that because um, some things never change. This is a picture um, that shows what I call the bachelor society era. Um, I mentioned the ratio of men to women was around 18 to 1, 17 to 1 in Toronto. Um, so this is on Louisa Street. And these four men are just sort of hanging around the entrance of a chop suey restaurant. So in the background, you can see one of the Eaton's factories. Um, and um, so I'm, this bachelor society, most of the men that were living in Toronto, they were married, but their wives and their families were in China, uh, back in China. So these men that were in Toronto live lives like bachelors um, because th there were very, very few women and very few families. Um, so few families, so few women, in fact, that um, in 1909, when this woman arrived, um, she arrived as the um, wife of um, a Mr. Locke. Um, 
when she arrived, she made the front page of the Toronto Daily Star. So that, again, to give you an idea of how rare it was to see a woman. And then that mentioned with Tom Locke um, being one of um, from one of the 12 or 13 families that were in Chinatown. And he is the son of Mr. and Mrs. Locke. Um, and Mrs. Locke is his mother, who was captured in this front cover photograph. So what kind of businesses the Chinese go into and why is it that Chinese are so closely associated with being in the Chinese laundry business? Well, this goes back to the early years of the gold rush, um, right through to construction of the CPR. Um, the Chinese started opening up laundries in those early years that and something that continued right up until Second World War. Um, so why is it that the Chinese went into this business? Well, for the Chinese, it was a niche business it was there was a high demand for laundry services again because there were so many men moving in immigrating into Canada to to work on projects very few women um, so there was cleaning services that were needed um, and you could with very little experience and know how open up a laundry business so you could partner and you could open these businesses hire your friends and relatives so you could work without having to work for a white employer and face a lot of discrimination. You could also, um, with very um, little revenue, afford to buy the, the, the supplies and equipment that you needed for a laundry. You were willing to work 16, 18 hours a day, six or seven days a week. And for the little that you charged to have things cleaned, um, you did not make a lot of money. But for the Chinese, this was their niche business. And so um, they opened these businesses. And just to give you an idea, in 1881, oh, I mentioned Sam Ching as the first um, Chinese laundry uh, in 1878. Um, but by 1881, there were 10 Chinese living in Toronto, and there were four laundries. 1891, 10 years later, there were 33 Chinese living in the city and 24 laundries. And by the 1920s, early 1920s, there were 374 laundries in the city. Most of them were scattered outside of the ward. There were only about 30 that were actually in the ward because you had to provide your service where there was demand. Um, so that most of those 374 were located around the city. And to remember that there were only 2,000 Chinese living in the city when there were 374 Chinese laundry. So you can see how important um, this business was to the early Chinese community. We're now at the bottom of Elizabeth Street. And uh, if we were to go to the right, you would see um, New City Hall on the right. But we're, this Hagerman Street is just a very short street in the back. Uh, you can see the Bay bus that runs north and uh, south on Bay Street. And you can see the Church of the Holy Trinity and behind that, the Marriott Hotel, which is um, where the Eaton Center complex is. This one little short street was the political heart of our original Chinatown. And that is because of this particular building, a three-story building. On the second floor was the Kuomintang Party. On the first floor was the Xinhua newspaper, which was the political newspaper of the Kuomintang Party. And then on the top floor was the Chinese Community Center. And um, the Chinese were very, very interested in um, politics because of their, the fact that they were from China and also their family were still in China. So they were very interested in developments that were happening uh, relating to the Guomindong party. And so um, I remember um, going there as a, a, as a kid, going to meetings there, um, listening to speeches in Chinese uh, on the second floor, which is where the meeting hall was. And even on Saturdays, I used to go there to um, study martial arts. So I frequented this building a lot as I, I was growing up. We're still basically on Hagerman Street, and this is Elizabeth Street. And uh, in the background, you can see the armories uh, that were on University Avenue. Um, and this shows two um, very important establishments as a second business for the Chinese. So the first is Chinese laundries, and the second would be Chinese cafes and Chinese um, restaurants. And you can see here, International Chop Suey House. Um, so these were very, very important. Started for about the same reasons as the laundries were. There was a real demand for food services. Um, it was a niche business. Again, long hours, long, many, many days of the week that you work. 
couldn't charge a lot of money like for 15 cents you could get a full course meal and all the bread you wanted to eat it was quite amazing uh, what you could get um, and it was very popular um, people really didn't go to Chinatown in those early years to eat um, and the ones that were not uh, kept out of Chinatown uh, especially were vaudeville actors because uh, Chinatown was just outside the theater district in Toronto and so you had the Hippodrome on Bay Street and other theaters on Young Street and so um, after shows were open they were finished they uh, the vaudeville actors and other actors knew that they went to Chinatown that they could get a really great meal at a very, very good price. So, um, but the nature of restaurants really changed. And um, I want to point out um, that same Hagerman Street. So where that seven up delivery truck is parked, that's that three story uh, building that had the Guamindong and the Xinhua newspaper and the Chinese community center um, on, the, on the third floor. Um, and so that building that you see is called Nanking. And after World War II, Nanking Restaurant, it opened in the in the late 40s, was the first of what we called the Big Four restaurants. So Nanking Restaurant was on that corner. And a, a couple of years later, Lychee Garden opened just a bit up Elizabeth Street. And Saiwu um, was the third restaurant that opened, and that would have been Saiwu Restaurant that was in that Lem Family Association building. And the fourth restaurant, uh, what we call the big four restaurants was the Kuang Chao restaurant that you can see on the right hand side. And that was my parents restaurant um, in Chinatown. What was the significance of these big four restaurants is um, they really um, helped to introduce and also bridge that gap between Chinese community and the larger community. Um, these big four restaurants, they were very large, they had white tablecloths, they were really um, very attractive to non-Chinese clientele. Of course, they were, you know, Chinese people went to the, the, the big four, but they also attracted non-Chinese clientele. It was a really big step in terms of how do we uh, connect up um, this, this Chinese community with the larger community. So these big four restaurants were very instrumental in doing that. So we're going to just uh, continue our walk um, on Elizabeth Street at the north end of City Hall. And if you walk there, you'll see this Heritage Toronto plaque that commemorates our first Chinatown. And why is that plaque there? I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but we're now going to go up um, a little, uh, Chestnut Street and uh, we will pass what used to be the site of this Chinese United Church, which before that was the British Methodist Episcopal Church, which was the, the, the um, a major church for the Black community when they were living in the ward. Now, the Chinese United Church um, opened up in the 50s, and then when it was uh, shut down, this, the church was torn down, and it was a vacant uh, parking lot for many, many years. And what is under construction right now is this new Toronto courthouse, uh, which will be um, quite spectacular. It's going to open up next year. And when this uh, opens up um, on the inside um, at the street level and outside the courthouse, there is going to be commemoration to people and the various groups that lived in the ward. Um, so there will be um, um, uh, uh, information. Um, different things and um, illustrations about the Chinese community that will be included in this display. So I'm really looking forward to um, visiting that when it opens up. So World War II was a really important uh, turning point in Chinese Canadian history uh, for many, many reasons, um, some including the um, volunteerism of um, about 600 Chinese Canadian who uh, served during World War II the millions of dollars that were raised by Chinese communities across Canada to support the war effort, the hundreds of uh, volunteers at home um, through services like the Red Cross and other voluntary um, organizations during the war. Um, so when the war ended, um, many good things happened, um, one being the end of the Exclusion Act in 1947. Another was the Chinese gained uh, the right to vote right across Canada. And this picture is a picture of Mr. Wan Kam Yao casting his vote in the election in 1949. And he was the first Chinese baby born in Canada. So it's really uh, wonderful to see that he got to vote um, in his senior years. 
And with the right to vote, Chinese could now run for public office. And this is a picture of Douglas Jung, who was the first Chinese Canadian to run successfully for politics. Uh, he was a member of parliament for Vancouver. And also with the right to vote, the Chinese were now allowed to go into professions right across Canada. Um, they could now go into um, medicine and law and pharmacy and so on. So things were looking up for the Chinese community, for sure, with the repeal, with the right to vote, with now being able to go in um, into different professions and run for public office. But what was happening, oh, even before that, um, even though the, the Chinese exclusionary law was repealed it, uh, in 1947, it took another 20 years until 1967 before all the clauses that really still hindered family reunification for Chinese families was removed. And so every year in, the, in that 20 year period, there were delegations that went to Ottawa to plead with the prime minister to please keep amending that immigration law because um, the Chinese who are living in Canada are still facing so many barriers to trying to bring over their families. This picture was taken in 1960 at one of these um, trips to visit the Prime Minister, and that's Prime Minister John Diefenbaker seated there. Um, and you can see it's all male except for one female, and that would be my mother, Jean Lum. And she was invited reluctantly to join this all male delegation because up until then it was always all male. And it was suggested that it would be important to have a woman included in the group because this was a family issue, a woman's issue. And also the immigration minister at the time was Ellen Fairclough, who was the first female cabinet minister ever. So my mother, again, reluctantly um, agreed upon by the rest of the group, the male group that she could come along, but she was given strict instructions to sit quietly in the back and not say a word. Well, as it turns out, the official spokesperson was Mr. Wong, who seated to the right of the Prime Minister. He was uh, the one that was presenting the brief. And um, Mr. Diefenbaker um, asked uh, Jean Lum to sit beside him uh, because he saw that she was the only female representative. So she sat beside the Prime Minister. And all through the presentation by Mr. Wong, the Prime Minister kept leaning over to my mother and saying, what's he saying? So my mother ended up repeating the entire brief into the prime minister's ear. And uh, they didn't discover until a few years later that the prime minister was hard of hearing in one side. So that's why my mother ended up reciting the whole brief um, into his good ear. So um, she ended up being um, the hero of the day. Um, and that started her, um, her reputation as, um, as a spokesperson for the Chinese community. Just to talk a bit, um, oh yes, I was saying that um, things were looking up for the Chinese after the World War II, but uh, what happened was um, the city had plans to build new city hall. So land was expropriated. And as it turns out, you can see this picture here where new city hall is being constructed and that building that was left standing until the last minute was the um, land registry building. Um, but uh, this is a rendering of the land that was expropriated. And um, it's just, you can see um, that blank space represented two thirds of our first Chinatown. And the one third that was left is at the bottom of that blank space there. So when New City Hall was completed and opened in 1965, there were plans to expropriate the rest of old Chinatown, our first Chinatown. But this time the Chinese community fought back at, because there was no community consultation the first time around. Um, and the, the, the Chinese community formed the Ch Save Chinatown Committee. And this was headed by my mother, uh, Jean Lum. And you can see her riding in this convertible. She's on Elizabeth Street. Um, uh, campaigning during that that um, uh, project to save what was left of Chinatown, and they were successful of saving that what was left of uh, Chinatown. So my mother uh, was very, very active, continued being a spokesperson, being very active, uh, was the first Chinese Canadian woman sitting on boards of Women's College Hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, University Settlement House, and so on. And um, she was named to the Order of Canada in 1976 as the first Chinese Canadian woman, and also Canada's first ever restaurateur ever inducted into the Order of Canada. 
And if we go back to Elizabeth Street, there is an Ontario Heritage Trust plaque that has been um, erected to commemorate her contribution to our early Chinese community. And the highest honour is the opening of a school last year at uh, the foot of Spadina, just north of Lakeshore Boulevard, the Jean Lum Public School. So we're now going to uh, walk along Dundas Street and head out of old Chinatown and head towards West Chinatown or Chinatown West. And um, you wonder, why is it that the Chinese went in that direction? Well, they couldn't go uh, north, east, or south because of other developments that were happening there. So they went west and they went to an area at Spadine and Dundas. And I mentioned earlier that when the Chinese moved into the ward, um, it, the Jewish community were moving out and coming to the Spadina and Kensington Market area. And so now the Jewish community was moving out of Kensington Market and Spadina area, moving north, and then the Chinese were moving into um, the existing buildings and businesses that were already established there. So it was ideal for the Chinese to move there because it was still affordable um, and there was there were the businesses there and there was also the um, garment factory business on Spadina which would provide a lot of employment. Um, so in the 30s, um, half of the workers that worked in the garment industry were Jewish and by the 70s half of the workers there were Chinese workers. So, so there were very many reasons why it was ideal for the Chinese to move into this Chinatown West. And the first building I want to stop at is on the south side of Dundas Street between Beverly and Huron Street. And on the second level, you'll see a, a moose there. And this is a close up of that moose, which we call the lucky moose. And anybody that might go back to the year 2000, when Mel Lastman was the mayor, um, he wanted to make Toronto the moose capital of the world. And so there were 300 moose um, all around the city that were decorated by whoever had um, purchased the moose. So um, our moose in Chinatown is called Lucky Moose because it is, um, it's created with the Chinese symbols for good luck. Um, so that's our Lucky Moose. And I kind of, the way he's standing at the entrance into West Chinatown, I feel that he's greeting all the people coming into our Chinatown West. Just walking along Dundas Street towards Spadina, we'll come across Jean Lum Lane. Um, and Jean Lum Lane was um, just launched a few years ago, just before pandemic hit. And uh, Jean Lum Lane is one of um, one of many, not Jean Lum Lane, but there are many laneways in Chinatown where you will find these beautiful murals. And this, uh, the mural that's in the Jean Lum Lane is uh, one of them is the Great Wall of China. And on the other side is are, are the buildings from the Forbidden City in Beijing. And these were commissioned by the Chinatown BIA, Business Improvement Area. Now the BIA was established, the Chinatown BIA was established after SARS because SARS really um, devastated our, our Chinatown. Um, the businesses, the restaurants, they lost a lot, like up to 90% of the business that they'd had. So the BIA was formed to really try to bring people back into Chinatown. And one of the many initiatives that they had were adding beautification projects. So the murals were one. And if you go just a bit further along um, Dundas Street, you'll get to Huron S Square. And um, this is a project to uh, provide seating in the area. So this the seating is uh, modeled after the Chinese animals in the horoscope. Um, and then there's this beautiful bronze statue of a what we call in Chinese Keilun. And it's a mythical figure to uh, ward off uh, evil spirits and to bring good luck. But what I really point out as an interesting historical building is the building on the right and at the top of where you can see the yellow, you can see AST. And that was the uh, remain what is re left of the sign for East Asian um, foods. And they were the fortune cookie factory in Toronto. And uh, in the 60s, when it was at its zenith, 
they were producing uh, 10,000 fortune cookies an hour, meaning 70,000 fortune cookies a day, a lot of fortune cookies. And um, they also made those big giant for, uh, fortune cookies. So when Mayor um, Mel Lastman, at the time the mayor of North York, went to China on a um, trade mission, he took with him 400 of these giant fortune cookies made at the Far Eastern factory. And inside was the fortune uh, that the fortune said, make come to North York and make your fortune. So um, another time that the Far, far Eastern um, uh, factory made fortune cookies was when the world of Susie Wong the movie was um, premiered in Toronto hundreds of fortune cookies were given away and some of the fortune cookies had uh, free dinners at the Nanking restaurant so I have fond memories of the fortune cookie factory because when I used to um, walk home from school if you dropped in the ladies were more than happy to give out uh, free samples of fortune cookies they weren't the really the the good fortune cookies, so those are the ones that didn't make uh, pass inspections, so they were still really great to eat, um, but um, they it was a treat to go there and, and get some flat, they were always flat fortune cookies. So now we get to the corner of Spadina and Dundas, and what I love about this building is it just shows the layers and layers of history and the different uses and the different buildings that have been just on that one site, which is typical for this corner, but it also is typical all along Spadina Avenue and Dundas Street and in the area there. So before this building was here, because right now if you go there, it, it's a drugstore on the street level and um, that the theater uh, is still there, but I'll, I'll just tell you a bit more about that in a second. But what was on that site before the the that theater was built was the residence of a Dr. Moorhead. And um, even before Dr. Moorhead built this residence, this beautiful mansion, it was a, a Methodist church that had uh, was built in 1871. And then Dr. Moorhead um, built this mansion and um, in 1886, and he lived there until the uh, 1920s. Um, and it was uh, an example of the type of mansion that you would have found on Spadina at that time. So several in the 1920s, he the the mansion was torn down and the standard was built and it turned out to be at the time at the heart of the Jewish community in the, in the 1920s, it was the uh, regarded as the finest Yiddish theater in North America. And then eventually the standard became the Strand, which was a movie house. And then the Strand became the Victory Theater. And then eventually the Victory Theater became the Victory Burlesque Theater. And so this picture here shows you that building and you can see the Victory sign there and also underneath Burlesque. And I remember some of those billboards had some pretty racy um, headliner acts uh, titled on the, on the billboards there. And uh, my claim to fame is, see, this is in the time when we were living in Toronto, the good, and everything was closed on Sundays. So the Chinese, what they did on Sundays, because the Victor Burlesque Theatre was not able to open on Sunday, the Chinese would rent the theater and they would um, have Chinese music performances, Cantonese opera performances, and also show Chinese films. And so my claim to fame is um, I used to do Chinese folk dances and uh, I remember performing on the stage of the Victory Burlesque when I was very, very young. Um, and I also remember performing on the stage of the Casino Burlesque Theater, which was on Queen Street, just at the, on the south side of Queen, just across the street from New City Hall. So my claim to fame is having danced on the stage of the Victory Burlesque Theater. So after the Victory Burlesque uh, closed, down, then there were a succession of Chinese movie houses, um, first the Golden Harvest, then the Pearl, and then the Mandarin. So it's gone through a lot. And my understanding is that the uh, theater is going, because it's still a theater inside, there's a balcony and there's seating there. Um, it's going to be um, reopened at some point. Somebody is uh, was renovating it. So I look forward to that time when it opens up to the public again. 
Um, just going a little bit north on Spadina of the north of the former Victory Theater is a plaque for uh, Wong Association of Ontario. So um, you can see that uh, if you're walking along Spadina. And this is their building, um, which is where the plaque is. And the Chinese characters on the top, um, in this case, don't read from the right to the left. They read from the left to the right. And Wong is the character on the left side. And again, anybody that had the surname Wong would belong to this family association. So they were um, among the, most of the family associations that moved to uh, West Chinatown when the first Chinatown was expropriated. And so the Wong Association had uh, meeting halls on the third floor, and then they rent the members rent out the first and second floor to re retail stores. And we get to go inside and look at what the meeting hall looks like. And so this is just an interior shot to give you an idea of um, how beautiful it is inside. So, um, and of course, these associations have are not no longer the foundation of the Chinese community. Um, so they are more um, social clubs um, and the members will get together to celebrate things like mid autumn festival, um, Chinese New Year, and so on. So um, this is the meeting hall of the Wong Family Association. On the opposite corner at Spadine and Dundas on the southwest uh, corner is the Dragon City Mall. And again, this um, represents all the different changes that have happened on this particular corner. Um, it used to be the site of the St. Philip's Anglican Church because all of this area was part of the Denison family estates. Um, and so when the Denison family started dividing things into um, lots, then we had um, Irish and Scottish people moving in, buying the lots and moving in and that this uh, Anglican Church was built to serve their needs. Um, and then um, this was built in 1884, and in the 1943, it became a Roman Catholic church uh, named St. Elizabeth of Hungary Church, and it was the center of the Hungarian community, particularly after 1946, um, the Hungarian Revolution, and so um, it was really um, this particular spot was the, the center of that community. Now, the the Hung brothers who developed the Dragon City Mall, um, they represented the new type of immigrant, uh, Chinese immigrant that were coming into Toronto. And I, at the beginning, I showed you that map of Guangdong province where most of the early Chinese came. And those Chinese would have been coming from uh, farming villages. They would, for the most part, not educated and not well off. And after Second World War, especially after 1967, um, when the government uh, revamped the whole immigration um, system and introduced the point system and Chinese were now um, accepted on equal footing as other immigrants coming from other parts of the world. But also we started seeing um, many people coming in from Hong Kong. And at one point, Hong Kong was the largest source of immigrants coming into Canada. And among those immigrants were many immigrants who had money um, to invest in, in Toronto. And so um, this Dragon City Mall was one of the investments by uh, one of the developers. And on the third floor of the Dragon City Mall um, was the site of the former Mandarin Club, which was the first exclusive uh, club that was set up by Chinese Canadian business people as a place to network and to um, conduct their business. And uh, now that, that club is, is no longer there, but it um, is now the, the Sky Dragon restaurant up on the top floor. So just walking south on um, Spadina, we're going to come across a house that's on the east side of Spadina, just a few blocks south of Dundas Street. And there's Icha Tea there, there's a bonsai store and, and a small eatery on the right side. And this was the site of the mansion of Houston Murray, who was a barrister. And so this beautiful mansion um, uh, is one example again of the many mansions that were on Spadina. And this is um, now considered as the oldest uh, building left in that in the area there. Um, so Mr. Houston had this built in 1872 and he lived there until 1907. And um, so it's gone through quite a few changes because it not was no longer a, a residence, but um, was used for commercial purposes. So it's a very um, it doesn't look too significant, but when you stand in front of it, it's a very large mansion, not as 
large as the one that was on the corner of Spadina and Dundas, but still a very magnific uh, magnificent uh, mansion. And across the street from Murray, uh, the Murray Home residence is Chinatown Center. And um, Chinatown Center is our last stop on the tour. And this was built in the 80s um, by a, a developer from Hong Kong. Uh, caused quite a lot of controversy in the community when it was built. Um, and again, you know, the resistance to um, uh, development of well, things in Chinatown and the way it was looking in Chinatown. Um, and this um, right now there's on the street level, on the lower level are um, businesses and food, food places. Um, it was the site of a Super 8 Hotel, uh, which was before that um, a very large uh, restaurant. But before this site was built, it looked like this. And this was China Court, which was developed by the same developers um, in the 70s. And um, it's such a shame that it was torn down to build uh, the Chinatown Center because um, this beautiful um, little development here you know there's a little gateway where you walked into the courtyard and there was a, a pagoda there and all on the main floor was a, a, a very large Chinese restaurant and many um, very nice retail stores and it became like the heart and the meeting place in Chinatown people went there to meet to, to, to linger in the courtyard many wedding pictures were taken under the pagoda there so it was such a shame because it was one of the few um, sites in our Chinatown that had buildings with Chinese architectural features on it. So um, it was a loss to, to have that replaced by Chinatown Center. Um, if you go there to, to Chinatown Center today, in the courtyard is the statue to um, commemorating Dr. Sun Yat-san, who's regarded as the father of modern China. And this is not just the first statue. There's uh, the original, the first statue of Dr. Sun Yat-san is that uh, East Chinatown, where we uh, are not going today on our tour. And this is the second one of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. So um, this is a gateway that you'll see in front of Chinatown Center. And you'll see many sculptures along um, Spadina Avenue on the uh, where the LRT is running. And this is what we call our gateway. And it was um, sculpted by Millie Chen, a local Chinese Canadian. And uh, what she did was she took um, traditional mythical Chinese figures like the dragon, the phoenix, the monkey king, and then shaped them to look like a Chinese character. And that Chinese character looks like that. And that means a door or a gateway. And so for me, symbolically, what this gateway symbolizes is people going back and forth in, in and out of our Chinatown. It's not like the traditional gateways where cars can drive under and people go in, but this is our gateway for Toronto. And it really brings me back to the time when our first Chinatown was really a place where that small community of 2000 were living because they wanted to stay it were, with safety in numbers. They were really segregated from the larger community and people really didn't, that were not Chinese, didn't go into Chinatown because it had a very bad reputation um, for being a place that you did not want to go to. So that's why when I mentioned the Big Four, their role in starting to make Chinatown, turning it into a, 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 a place to go, a destination. And so with this gateway, we have people going freely back and forth, people from all walks of life. Um, from And we are really talking about a very diverse community here. Um, living in Toronto, I mean, here you look at New City Hall, Think of our first Chinatown, think of our Chinatown that we have at Spadine and Dundas, our third Chinatown, which had uh, was at Broadview and Girard, and now Chinese are living all around the GTA. So from that one Chinese man, Sam Ching, in 1878, there are now over half a million Chinese living in the greater Toronto area. And it's a very diverse community in terms of where they come from, what parts of China or other parts of the world, what languages they speak, what customs, what traditions what kind of foods they eat, very, very diverse now. And so Chinatown, then and now, past and present, our current Chinatown is facing a lot of challenges, um, gentrification, um, affordability, uh, rising rents, rising uh, real estate. And with COVID happening now, there are many, many challenges that are um, have to be faced. And um, hats off to the uh, Chinatown BIA 
and for organizations like the Friends of Toronto Chinatown, which are working hard to um, make Chinatown um, a place that you will continue want to be go visiting for a long time to come. And I know we're we've got some time and we're going to be spending some time with some uh, questions. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask me, but before we do that, I just want to thank Heritage Toronto very, very much for giving me this opportunity to share um, my knowledge, uh, to share with you, to build awareness of an understanding of our community here in Toronto. Um, there are so many more places to explore. I've only sort of touched the tip of the iceberg. And you might have noticed I really did not talk about Chinese restaurants, with the exception of the big four, which was that were in our first Chinatown. Um, and that was delivered because Heritage Toronto has another tour um, called Walk, A Walk in Chinatown. And it's not W-A-L-K, it's W-O-K, A Walk in Chinatown that will be presented uh, virtually as well um, and presented by my uh, my husband, Professor Chef Leo Chan. So he will give you all the delicious details of eateries and restaurants and food in Chinatown. So I, I hope you'll sign up for his session. So I really encourage you to come and explore um, so many things to uh, really great food now no longer just Cantonese food but all kinds of different foods and then the supermarkets here in the store so I hope this um, tour just gives you um, that sampling of our Chinatown and it makes it so inviting that you're going to come soon and make a visit so thank you thank you Arlene for a wonderful presentation we'll now open the floor to questions. Uh, remember, you can ask a question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So I'm going to just be sort of moderate here. And um, so let's see. Uh, you, uh, so, uh, Paul asks, does the same family name mean that they're all blood relatives? Okay, if they have the same name, and again, I, I mentioned like for the Lums, because my surname is Lum, so my father belonged to that Lem Sai Ha Tong, um, Lem Lim Lin, um, it's all the same Chinese character. And the whole, when, when I showed you the interior of the Wong Association and there were some portraits um, uh, that I didn't point out at the time, but those are portraits of the Wong ancestors. So the, the belief is that all the Wong, all the Lums came from the same ancestors. So, um, and that's why it's, it's such a strong tradition in, in Chinese culture when you meet somebody with the same surname that um, when I grew up, we called them aunties and uncles because, you know, the idea is that somehow way back, if you trace things back, we were um, all related at some point. Yeah. Thank so you. thanks for that question. All right. Here's a tough question. Do you happen to know what the inflation equivalent would be of the head taxes if, if they were in the like in, in, in current dollars? Um, yes, so the when it was at its worst at $500 to purchase two houses in Vancouver. Now, if you were to purchase two houses in Vancouver today, it would be millions of dollars. Um, <laughs> no, I, I unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that, um, how that would uh, convert into uh, current day dollars. But it was really um, a very uh, heavy tax to pay. And I, you know, I know stories of uh, people who had paid the head tax. And like one man said, he had to pay $500. My father paid the $500 head tax. Uh, but this one story I was telling you about is um, this man, he paid the $500 head tax. His mother had to pay the $500 head tax, which was paid by his father. And it took 17 years for his father to pay back that. So he had, the father had to look, borrow $1,000 to pay for that head tax. Oh my God. Um, but again, um, the good part of that is that that particular individual, um, he was lucky enough to afford to bring over um, his wife and his son to come to Canada, even though there was that head tax. And again, you look at that push factor to get out of China, all that, you know, that starvation and all those natural disasters and just the political situation was so unsettled there. Um, so that people, they, you know, really 
borrowed money, they did whatever they could to leave and go to what was called Gold Mountain. So after the gold rush, um, Canada became known as, as Gold Mountain. Um, so as much as that head tax and my father, when he, my father paid the $500 head tax, my uh, grandfather came in 1899. Um, so he would have paid the $50 head tax. And then my grandfather was lucky enough to bring over my grandmother a few years later in the early 1900s. So um, she would have had to pay $100 for the head tax. And then they had a family of 12 children, but they were among the few uh, families again um, in, in Nanaimo and Vancouver. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't as severe there as it was in Ontario and in Toronto. Um, and we're not even sure if I'm talking about that. When we think of Sam Ching, how he came to Toronto in 1878, because if the rail, railway, the CPR wasn't completed until 1885, there is a theory that Sam Ching came up from the United States because the rail transcontinental railway system was finished much earlier down in the States. So this man must have come across because all the Chinese coming in were landing on the Pacific coast. And yes. so without that CPR, uh, you, you would have had to ride a horse or something to, to come as far as Ontario. So there's a theory. But anyhow, the, the at one point, like 99% of all Chinese living in Canada were living in British Columbia. So they once the railway was completed, the Chinese slowly started moving um, east um, across Canada. Thank you. People love the story about your mother and you know, Mr. Diefenbaker. <laughs> so we have a number of comments on that. Um, uh, let's see. Somewhat uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how many Chinese, how, how long have many of the Chinese grocery stores been around? Yeah, so Chinese grocery stores have been around, they, they were almost like the third major kind of business that the Chinese went into. So after laundries and after restaurants and cafes, it was like grocery stores and market gardens so that the two were very tied together. And so I know we have um, records of grocery stores on the West Coast going back to the gold rush time. So they, they've been around for a long, long time as well. And a, a lot of these Chinese, the early Chinese grocery stores, they would have imported their goods to sell to all the Chinese immigrants who were coming here. They would have sold them uh, maybe some spices, the Chinese tea, rice, um, those kinds of supplies. Um, that's what the chi early Chinese uh, would have been selling in their grocery stores. Are, are the Chinese grocery stores today still owned by the Chinese uh, along Spadina or, or are they I've, I've, for some reason I've gotten the impression they were Vietnamese some of them are owned by, by Vietnamese immigrants yeah, yeah I mean I there are uh, several um, Chinese grocery stores still in Chinatown and it's interesting that you mentioned the, the Vietnamese because um, there you know I talked about the diversity of the Chinese community and um, so coming from China and from Taiwan and Hong Kong Macau and from you know South Africa all around the world um, but when the war in Vietnam ended in 1975 and then Canada was really um, so generous in welcoming refugees come that you know the boat people who were fleeing out of Vietnam a lot of those uh, Vietnamese refugees were Chinese ethnic Chinese people oh. And so that's why um, they settled, uh, so many uh, Vietnamese settled in the Chinatown area because many of them were ethnic Chinese. Um, so a lot of the stores um, are owned by Chinese, but I don't, I, I couldn't say exactly if they're um, Chinese uh, from Vietnam, originally from Vietnam or oh. where they're from, but um, yeah. And there is a new TNT that opened on yeah. college just uh, west of Spadina and that was that whole chain which started out in the west coast um, is owned by was originally started up by um, family in Taiwan and uh, it's, been, it's the family is still um, running it but it is now also it was bought out by Loblaws um, mm -hmm. so it's just another example of yeah. a, a supermarket. Yes. Yeah. Um, a question um, an, from an anonymous attendee Chinatown in Cantonese is called Tong Yang Gay. I may mispronounce that. Tang People Street. Which street is this referring to? Dundas? Yes, Tong Yang Gai means um, Tong Yan is, yes, the street of the Tang people. And this expression goes back, it predates the whole 
phrase Chinatown, and we're not even sure when that phrase Chinatown started, um, because the, the Chinese call it the street of the Tang people. And in Toronto, it's, just, it's really a generic term referring to Chinatown, not to a specific street. So Chinatown is called Tongyun Gai, which means Chinatown. So it doesn't mean okay. it's Dundas Street or Spadina Avenue. It's not just the, the area of Chinatown. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Testing my pronunciation of Cantonese. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you know, Jetty asks who the first Taiwanese person was who came to China? Don't have that information, okay. no. But uh, there were a lot of, there are a lot of people from Taiwan that have come to Canada um, and invested um, in, in Canada a lot because of the political uncertainty of Taiwan uh, on the island there. Yeah. Okay. And I've just got, I'm going to got one, one last question here because um, we have to end this. Um, interesting. Uh, Bernice, who is a PhD student studying um, in the field of ethnomusicology. And her research centers around Chinese diaspora and the sounds that surround us. She's an immigrant from Hong Kong. Can you share anything about the sounds from your childhood that were distinctly Chinese or sounds that are Chinese Canadian? When I was growing up, my mom, even at the time when I was so young that I had to take afternoon naps, so before I started school, my mother was always playing music. And it was a whole variety of music. It, was, um, it included Cantonese opera. It included um, popular songs that were coming from Hong Kong, but it also included Rodgers and Hammerstein. I can sing you all the words for all the, you know, Oklahoma and all, you know, all those musicals, but my mother always played music um, at home. Uh -huh. And so I grew up listening to um, Chinese um, opera, Cantonese opera. And again, um, when we went to the casino theater and afterwards to the Victory Burlesque Theater, um, there were Chinese performances. So I was exposed a lot to um, Chinese um, music, Cantonese opera in particular. So that was part of my childhood growing up. Very interesting. I'm afraid we have to, we have to end the questions now. Um, I'd like to thank Arlene again for a wonderful presentation. Um, and I'd also like to thank our, 20, our 2021 tours presenting sponsor, TD, for making this tour possible. Uh, if you enjoyed this tour, you might want to check out other great tours we're offering this season, both virtually and in person. And as Arlene mentioned, there, there, there is the walk, W-O-K, around Chinatown coming up uh, very soon. Um, details can be found on our on the Heritage Toronto website um, under What's On. Heritage Toronto is proud to be a donor-driven charity. Over the past year, donor support has allowed us to continue serving Toronto by prioritizing our emerging historian opportunities. And these, these are the, the people who develop new tours and have expanded our digital programming. If you believe in the importance of engaging with our past and share our passion for Toronto and the, the great city we live in, please take action and join our circle of donors or renew your support today. You'll see at the bottom of the screen that, the, um, where, where, uh, that you can do this online, by mail, or donate by phone. Actually, people really enjoy, Darlene, we're still getting messages from people saying how much fun that they've had watching this presentation. So thank you again. Bye-bye.